Well, well, the hen reed beds was created just about 10 years ago. I would think from 2003 onwards, the, the starlings have, have come each winter. The roost can last from a few weeks to you know, about three months. You know, very often uh, the roost here can build up from mid-October and be building and it will peak somewhere around Christmas time. And then some, suddenly they all vanish and they'll move to another site further down the coast. And it'd be another reed bed, whether it be at Walberswick or at um, Marlborough, somewhere along the coast, they'll, they'll just move on again. We reckon one year we had about a quarter of a million here. That's just fantastic. What, what the starlings are looking for when they come here is a safe place to roost. It's safety in numbers because obviously you've got known predators, aerial predators from sparrowhawks, uh, uh, hobbies, things like that. Um, so they're looking for a safe place to, to roost where uh, not only are they safe from aerial predators but they're also safe from ground predators. So a reed bed creates both that because you've got water below the reed which means okay yes you could get mink and otters called, might drop into a roost and uh, maybe take the odd one. Uh, but also, you know, the numbers are once they're down into the into the roost itself, then they're, they're safe away from sparrowhawks and things like that because you can't crash through the reeds quite as bad, quite as much to uh, pick them off. When you see starlings uh, and and all flocks of birds when they're flying, they always want space between themselves and their neighbour when they're flying. They need a, a, a clear air space to fly in, and so it's the same as uh, if you're driving along the M25. Somebody breaks a mile ahead, and that ripple effect comes back and you eventually get to the other end and you don't even know what happened. And that's what happens with the starlings. So, so if its neighbour moves sort of an inch nearer to it, it will go left. And so that's Constantine in front of the whole flock and they all then move. And then of course, as soon as somebody moves slightly out of kilter the other way, away they go the other way. And it's just keeping your own space within an airspace. When the birds start to come into the reed bed at, at just about dusk, they'll all suddenly just drop in. And because there are, there are constantly birds new smaller flocks join in the bulk of the birds that they'll go into a small patch of reed at the back and if that patch but isn't large enough to contain them all then it's almost a rolling effect they, they roll across the reed bed and then drop into a larger section of reed again it's the safety in numbers nobody wants to be on the outside edge of that reed where they where they could be vulnerable to a predator so it's uh, want to be in the middle because if you're in the middle nobody's likely to get hold of you you might grab your neighbor next door <laughs> If you see the state of the reed bed after you've had about 30, 40, 50,000 starlings all hanging on, each one's hanging on to an individual or one or two reed stems, you know, a starling can weigh 30 odd grams, so eventually all the reed in, within that part of the reed bed is flattened. So they actually destroy their roost. And, uh, and of course, it, it can give us slight problems with water quality because you've got that many birds all coming, all the droppings all disappearing into the water, huge nutrient build up. So, Starlings is a double-edged sword in a, in a reed bed, you know, fantastic spectacle, but that can have impacts on the water quality. <laughs>